Good evening. Good evening. Uh-oh. Okay, so we have our first issue of the night. Uh, I didn't hear a, a response. Good evening, everybody. All right, that's what I like to hear. My name is Jazz Hampton. Uh, I'm a student at the University of St. Thomas School of Law, um, and I'm going to be one of your two MCs tonight. Uh, just a brief introduction of myself before I have my co-host introduce himself. Uh, I became a part of the, the civil rights clinic at St. Thomas called Community Justice Project. Uh, through the Community Justice Project, I had an amazing opportunity, and that was to work with Profes Pro Professor Levy Pounds, who we call PLP. You might hear that acronym here and there tonight. Um, and I began working with Brotherhood. Uh, and it was through that that I've gotten to know and love this organization so much. Uh, I'm, I'll talk plenty tonight. You might get sick of my voice. Uh, but I'll be, I'll be speaking on some of the important things that this organization has done for me, uh, for the members, and for the community as well. Uh, to start, first, I'm also going to have my co-host introduce himself as well. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kenny Kelly. Um, I am a part participant at Brotherhood Brew. Um, one of your co-hosts tonight as MCN. Everyone looks beautiful tonight. I, I would like everybody to get ourselves a hand tonight. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, you, you good. You good. All right. Um, yeah, my mama taught me that. She said, uh, if you ever got to speak in front of a lot of people, make sure, make sure they clap. Matter of fact, matter of fact, everybody stand up and give yourselves a, a standing ovation. You look good tonight. You're looking real good. You're looking, you're looking magnificent. Everybody, everybody. Yeah. Yes. It's, doesn't that feel beautiful? Now I can tell my mama I got a standing ovation. But uh, everyone enjoy your meals. Uh, OK. Well, while you're enjoying this meal, I'm going to introduce somebody pretty special that most of you know about in here. Uh, she's a lot of the reason why that table over there is still strong. We have faith. It's hard to have faith in someone when you almost believe in nothing. When you have someone that shows you that she cares about your well-being without saying it, that's got to be that you got to appreciate somebody like that. For somebody to help present opportunities to somebody that doesn't really know what an opportunity is, you got to appreciate somebody like that. And with that being said, I would like to introduce someone very special to me and to a lot of people I'm sure in here tonight, Miss Nikiva Levy Pounds. Good evening, everyone. It is amazing to look out at this audience and to see so many beautiful people here tonight celebrating with us at Brotherhood, Inc. and lifting up the young men who are part of the program. This symbolizes to the young men that the community cares about them and their well-being. And it warms my heart to see it as well. This is our fifth annual Night of Brotherhood Gala, and believe it or not, this is one of the main ways in which we can keep our program going. We literally operate off of a shoestring budget by faith, <laughs> and, and God has blessed us year after year since 2011 to be able to employ young men in the community and to give them hope and to remind them that they have a purpose in life and that if given the opportunity, they can make significant contributions, which we've already seen from many of our young men in the program. 
Now, when I was standing here tonight, as people were walking in, I almost um, ran up to someone like, you know how you're at a concert and you see, you know, the performer and you're just excited because they're your favorite performer? Well, that's how I felt when I saw Father Greg Boyle walk in from Homeboy Industries of Los Angeles. He is my hero, and I'm just so thankful that he could be here tonight to celebrate with us and to inspire us to continue to persevere based on some of the things that Homeboy has experienced. I'd like to thank every member of the Brotherhood, Inc. Board of Directors. I would like to ask you to stand for a moment so that we can recognize you. Don't be shy. Where's Naida? Naida wasn't listening. Brotherhood. <laughs> Thank you all for all of the time, effort, and energy that you put into the program. I mean, really, th this program functions off of the basis of our volunteers. If you are a Brotherhood, Inc. volunteer or have volunteered in the past, could you please stand? Bruce, I'd also like to thank all of our sponsors for tonight's program. If you look inside your program, there are lists of gala sponsors, benefactors, and table sponsors. And these are individuals who have gone above and beyond to either host a table, sponsor a table, or utilize their networks to encourage people to attend. I believe in the power of human capital. You know, we know that we need financial capital, but human capital is also extremely important. So we wanna thank each and every one of you, as well as all of our silent auction donors. For those who visited the silent auction, you can see that there's a wonderful array of items that are available. And though all of those items have been donated by local companies and individuals. This program would not be possible tonight without the support of students at the University of St. Thomas Law School who are part of the Community Justice Project. I can just tell you that as their professor walking in tonight, they already had everything completely set up. And they said, PLP, we got this. Just go and mingle. Now hearing that is, <laughs> is incredible because normally you, know, you can bear the weight of a lot of responsibility, but having these students who love brotherhood, who believe in brotherhood, who believe in the power of second chances, give of their time, their talents, and their resources is absolutely incredible. Let's give them a hand. I'm also excited that Kenneth Kelly and Jazz Hampton agreed to serve as our host tonight. It's both of their first time in this role. So I just told them, relax and be, th be themselves. So if we can encourage them tonight, laugh at their jokes, even if they're not great, I think that would be immensely helpful. I want to call up um, Dr. Paula Nordham, who is going to bless the food and bless tonight's um, evening. Dr. Nordham has been, she doesn't like me calling her doctor, but that is her title. She has been involved um, in Brotherhood for a number of years, really from seeing us out in the community and feeling a pull to come out and help. And you have no idea what a significant contribution she's made to the organization. So let's welcome her to give tonight's blessing. So this evening, instead of being blessed with snow, we were blessed with a little bit of rain and now sunshine. Let us pray together in one spirit. In these days, Holy One, we are witnesses. We stand as witnesses and advocates and prophets 
shining light on the continued oppression and systemic violation of many of your children in this country and throughout the world. Our national spotlight brings awareness of centuries-old marginalization and persecution that will not stand. Filled with your light, your divine light, we are beacons of hope. As Maya Angelou claimed for her son, we are each unique and precious children of the King of your divine mercy and goodness. And compassionate one, we are one with you and with one another. Bless this time and this community and all the communities that shed holy light on our cities and our world. Sent forth as blessings, we are witnesses to and active participants in what the world can truly become, your kingdom and realm here on earth. In your powerful spirit, we pray and let the people say, Amen. I don't know what Professor Levy Pounds was talking about. All my jokes are funny no matter what. So that's fine. Um, before I bring out uh, Mr. Choi for the opening remarks, I just want to make one more reminder uh, for later in the night or throughout the night. We do have some vendors, vendor items being sold in the back right corner, my back right. Uh, and on the back wall is the silent auction. So please feel free to uh, go up to the silent auction at any time, um, as well as Brotherhood Brew that's being sold uh, on the left as well. And one time before we move on also, let's give up a hand for this band and their mu amazing music. <laughs> there are many people in this room that helped uh, Brotherhood become what it is today. One of those individuals is John Choi. Uh, John Choi was here at the, at the groundwork from Brotherhood from the very beginning. Uh, he's currently the Ramsey County attorney and at the time he was a St. Paul City attorney. And so he had the very strong ties to the young men over in St. Paul when it started. I've, I've had the opportunity to hear him speak at a few different events, uh, and, and we're lucky to say that he's giving opening remarks today. So I would like everyone to uh, clap their hands with me and uh, welcome John Choi to the stage. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. I've been actually looking forward to this event uh, for quite some time when I found out that um, uh, Father Boyle would be the person who would be here uh, speaking because I remember when we first started talking about some of the things that were going on in St. Paul at that time when I was the St. Paul City Attorney. It was around 2006, and we started having conversations with Nick Leek at the NAACP and Professor Nakima Levy-Pounds. and. One of the things that we recognize is that we had to make some changes. And so we made some changes in the police department relative to obstructing legal process arrests. We started restorative justice uh, work with respect to the resolution of some of the criminal cases in the office, uh, the lower level cases. Uh, but one of the things that um, we talked about was this concept of uh, this holistic approach and really what we really need to be doing in prosecution, law enforcement, and everybody who touches the lives of people to recognize. I think sometimes we have so much work to do in the, in the system that we forget about that. And what all of you are doing tonight is supporting an organization that I think is so criti critical for the success, not only of the people that are participating, uh, who are part of um, the, the, uh, the brotherhood industry in the coffee selling, uh, but also it's so critical for the, uh, the health of our community that we believe in the concept of a second chance, that we believe that all individuals uh, deserve dignity and that we should be doing everything to help uh, individuals and groups who are not doing as well. And so that is the premise of why we are all here tonight, to support not only brotherhood, but to support uh, this important concept. And 
as I look out into this audience, we really have a wonderful community. I'm looking at all of you who are a part of it, who are here to support uh, this really fine organization. And for me, it's just an honor and a pleasure uh, to have been involved in the early discussions of how this could happen in our community. And I think we should give a lot of credit to the University of St. Thomas, the Community Justice Project, and Professor Nakima Levy-Pounds, and all of our students uh, who work so hard to make this uh, what it is today. Because today, this is the actual, the fifth annual dinner. And I've been to every one of these. And ev every time I feel like it gets bigger and bigger. Um, and so I'll, this is a, a really good thing that's happening in our community. And so I just want to thank all of you uh, for making the time to be a part of it. So thank you. Hello. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're going to enjoy some music from the band as uh, this food comes out. And we get to feast on some chicken piccata. Don't ask me what that is. Um, everybody enjoy it. Thank you. All right, while dinner is being served, at this time, I have a few announcements to make. There will be people walking around with beads, and the beads are $5 each, and we will play a bead game at the end of the night, and the winner will receive an iPad mini that's worth over $250. Um, and you'll see the iPad mini continuing to flash throughout the night, and so beads are $5 each or five for $20. The maximum number of beads that each individual can play with is five beads. So if you buy 100 pairs of beads, you're going to have to give them away, 95 of them away, just to keep the game fair. But it's a really fun game at the end. So please um, purchase beads as they're coming around for $5. Please uh, visit the silent auction in the back. And what we're going to do as dinner is being served is call up some of our esteemed guests and public officials who are going to provide some remarks for us. First, I'm going to call up Chief Tom Smith of the St. Paul Police Department. He will be followed by Commissioner Tony Carter. And we may have a couple of other individuals who are interested in providing brief remarks. Let's welcome Chief Tom Smith. Thank you, Nakima, and I'm glad to see everybody here tonight. Uh, and you're right, last year was snowing. The year before was really snowing. Some of us that were here remember trying to get out of here, uh, and it was very difficult. But um, I'm honored to be here tonight. I just want to say a couple words. Um, you know, recently back in March, some of us that are in this room, we went down, and I know that uh, Nakima was there, to Birmingham, Alabama. Then we went up to Selma for the historic 50-year March celebration on the Pettus Bridge. Um, and then a group of us from St. Paul also went up to uh, Memphis. And the reason why we went, it was about healing and about peace and about what do we do to move the dial forward and the dialogue forward when we get back home. And I was very proud to be part of that group. Brotherhood Inc. is an organization that's moving forward. They have a lot of fine young men that the Pounds family has helped to keep together and to do positive things. And in fact, some of you may have seen before that in St. Paul we have this program called the Ambassadors. It's a group of very diverse people that work as a buffer between the police and the city of St. Paul and our young people to promote peace on the streets. Um, also to kind of push young people in a direction where they can find jobs with different nonprofit organizations, um, to help them get jobs and resume writing and all sorts of other things. And we've been able to hire one of the participants of Brotherhood Brew, who is one of our ambassadors. I still think he should be a national TV correspondent, Nakima. He's, he's just really good. Um, so there are a lot of positive things that are going on uh, in the city, a lot of tough things that are going on in our country, and a lot of good dialogue as we go forward. So I will tell you as, as your chief, and I'm a little different chief, 
I believe that we need to promote peace. We need to have young people. The best thing that is the best crime fighting tool in the world is mentorship and opportunities. And I really believe in that. And we are pushing that forward. So I want to congratulate all the people with Brotherhood Brew. The coffee, by the way, is fantastic. I have three mugs at home, and I will buy coffee before I leave as well. But also, let's open up our hearts um, and our checkbooks as well later on tonight. Thank you, and God bless you. So I would do it the hard way, right? <laughs> I'm Tony Carter, Ramsey County Commissioner, and I want to say welcome to my district. This is uh, the middle of District 4 in Ramsey County, and I am thrilled to be here because Brotherhood's work has been impacting my district, the city, this entire area. And I'm so thankful for the leaders who came together to begin this work some years ago and to be here now for the fifth celebration. I want to thank all of you for being here. This is an opportunity for us to illustrate our support as a community, our support for this work that we all know needs to happen before the organization of this work and the caring for it by the leaders of brotherhood who are stepping forward and who are enduring the trials and the difficulty of making certain that, as we heard Sister Nakima say, on a very small budget, this work does incredible, incredible work in the lives of young people. So I want to give a big round of applause to brotherhood again, and most of all, to the young people who are the evidence of the effectiveness of this work. So our being here together tonight is a statement of joint support. It's on one day, but it doesn't represent one day of work. We're lifting up the work that Brotherhood does with a connected community every single day of the year. I'm not trying to give the envelope pitch ahead of time, but I do want to say that I'm thankful for the ability and for the knowledge that whatever we do as individuals tonight will support that incredible day-to-day -day work every day of the year. So once again, I want to thank Brotherhood. I want to thank all of you. Thank you so much for your support. See you eating my chicken. I'm at table 18. Don't touch it. Uh, next, I'm going to, once again, as I said at the beginning of this uh, program, my name is Jazz Hampton. I'm a, a law student at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, through that, through our university, we have a chance to work with Brotherhood through a class. Um, so we get class credit for actively being involved in this organization. Um, and for those that, it, it kind of struck me as a chord when I, was, when I was first looking at joining this class. Uh, when I was growing up, my, my family took in about 11 different young men that were in our community that, that didn't have a stable home. Um, and and when, when I was looking at classes and opportunities to, to, bring, to bring some of my law degree to the real world, this is, this is something I saw as this class opportunity. And next up is going to be two students that are also a part of this class. You know, I was in this last year, and there are two students that are currently in the program right now. And they're going to present to you a little bit of the work they've been doing to help Brotherhood and some of the future endeavors that Brotherhood has planned. And the two students are named Ngiri and Rachel Sebastian. Good evening, everyone. 
Thank you so much for coming tonight. My name's Ngeri Azawa. And I am Rachel Sebaski. And as Jazz mentioned, we are both members of the Community Justice Project, which is a legal services clinic at the un University of St. Thomas that focuses on civil rights and uh, social justice issues. Some of the topics that we covered this year are mass incarceration, servant leadership, and the school to prison pipeline, just to name a few. If you ask past and present members what the best part of law school is, there is a good chance everyone will say clinic, uh, like me and Gary definitely would. But before we go on, I would like to ask all the Brotherhood guys to stand up, give them a round of applause, and thank them for their dedication to the community. So Brotherhood Inc. was a nonprofit organization started by the Community Justice Project, as we'd already said, and it serves African-American males between the ages of 16 to 24 who have been either at risk of involvement with the criminal justice system, juvenile justice system, or gang activity, or are currently involved in such things. So we um, kind of set out to help empower them and inspire them to reach their fullest potential, give them the resources necessary to do so, which includes a range of classes that are offered and social entrepreneurship skills training and things of that nature. And it's modeled after Homeboy Industries, which is um, in California. We have Father Boyle here who's gonna tell us all about that. Um, and like I said, it just focuses on just transforming the lives of these wonderful, wonderful men. So we have pictures of things that we've done throughout this year. This is Dr. Mahmoud al Khati, who comes on Wednesdays to teach classes. He's a civil rights figure who just really just likes to spread the knowledge of things that are pertinent to the African-American community. Brotherhood also um, offers different catering options where the guys will either contact other, organi other organizations or establishments that might be in need of coffee or tea and um, offer tastings to um, have them try it out beforehand or just service the community with those beverage needs. Brotherhood also has a number of events throughout the year. This past year, we had a Black History Month event at Brotherhood. We also had a Mother's Day event where we honored the mothers in the community. We had a breast cancer awareness event as well. No, not Mother's Day, sorry, breast cancer. My bad. In the community, we also attend different events. These pictures are from Professor Levy Pounds' Real Talk Live event where some of the guys came, they catered, and they also participated in the discussion. Okay, so this is Brotherhood's newest social enterprise. It is a silkscreen printing business named Brotherhood Inc. with a K. And that name was thought of by some of the members at Brotherhood. So last year at this time, Brotherhood had moved into their new space and had completely revamped it, bigger, better, and there is a spot for the silkscreen printing company that officially moved in this year. So here is a picture of the space. We had uh, electricians come in and rewire. We had construction for a dark room, which is something needed. And after months of researching, me and Muna Hassam were finally given the go ahead to purchase the equipment. It was delivered, it was set up. The guys have uh, gone through formal training in our silk screening masters. And here's what it looks like inside. So what you see there is the printing press and the conveyor dryers in the back. And here is a close-up of that. And here is a close-up of the printing press with one of the practice t-shirts and another piece of equipment called the flash cure. So we're hoping Brotherhood Inc. will officially be up and running sometime very soon, but there are a few final touches, including the awning. This is what the awning will look like. It will be right next to the existing Brotherhood awning on University Avenue. We're hoping that people passing by, whether on foot or car or bus or the light rail that goes right by there, will see the awning and want to check it out. So. If you need any t-shirts or sweatshirts, whatever it may be, 
think of Brotherhood Inc., give the guys a call, and they will not disappoint. And while it's the newest social enterprise, it is not the only one. So I'm going to turn it over to Gary, who will talk about the Brotherhood Brew Cafe. So another social enterprise that we have in the works is the Brotherhood Brew Cafe, which should be opening later sometime this year. We're still in the construction phase, kind of working out the kinks, but it is ongoing. And we hope for this space to just be a space where individuals can come and just feel, I don't know, warm and together and engage one another, and old and young, and we'll also have open mic events there. We'll have a conference room for people to reserve and just hope for it to be a space where we can all feel love. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. September, oh, okay, so we do have a date, well, month. September 2015 is when we're slated to open, so fingers crossed we'll be there. Um, throughout the semester, like I said, we had a number of um, sponsored ideas with the Community Justice Project. One of the events was the Uncaged Voices, which is a poetry slam that we host every semester. And it's for youth and other members of the community to just come and have a space to speak about the issues that are important to them. So this past year, we had a number of artists, next slide, a number of artists come out, and it was hosted at Intermediate Arts. Here we have our MC, Sadiq Abdullah, who was unable to make it tonight, but here he is in the picture, and the theme that we had ongoing that year was Black Lives Matter. And this is a crowdfunding endeavor that I had done with CJP alum, Ashley Oliver, for Sadiq Abdullah, who is the Brotherhood Catering Manager, Sales Manager, and Board Member. He started his own production company, and we decided to surprise him with money to do so. So it's very, very difficult to be at Brotherhood and know that we have this big surprise and look him in the face and act like we're not hiding anything. We're able to kind of pull it off. There was a little mix-up in getting <laughs> getting the word out. We begged PLP to just kind of share it and we wanted to unveil it and weren't able to do so, but he was still surprised. So we were very grateful. He was grateful. So here is the construction that's going on downstairs at Brotherhood for his production company. Oh, okay. And this, <laughs> this is him um, buying the products he needs. So we're able to raise about $2,000 and he was able to purchase his laptop here. And then, next picture, sorry. I don't know what this is called, but I just called the big keyboard, so he bought that too. So thank you to all of you that donated, because I know a lot of you donated, so thank you. And over the summer, we were also able to visit, I was able to visit this past summer, um, Homeboy Industries. A couple of the guys here were able to visit last semester. Eight, eight guys went and there's a photo that Sadiq had taken with Father Boyle last semester. And he just sang his praises, of course. I wish he was here to do so himself, but he just had an absolutely amazing time. We wanted to make sure we put that in here for him. So on my trip to California that I was able to go with CJP member Miriam El Rashidi, we were able to stop by Homegirl Cafe, which has amazing food and amazing staff, Father Boyle. We loved it. And... Um, just kind of see how members of the community just sang Father Boyle's praises about how much he has changed their lives and how invested he is in the community. Just, it made us tear up to see how much he just loves them and they love him. So we were able to take the tour and these were two individuals that we'd encountered who just told us their life stories and how inspired they've been by Father Boyle, how he remained invested in them. They would kind of, you know, shy away and he'd always just make sure he helped them understand that he's still there no matter what. So it's very inspiring for us to hear that. And this here <laughs> is, um, we just want to let you guys know that Brotherhood Brew Coffee is very, very good. We want to kind of get that plug in there. This is a testimonial of sorts. In CJP, the Elder Law Clinic made a t-shirt. And number four says that Brotherhood Coffee equals a godsend. So we want to let you guys know that it's very good coffee. It keeps the Elder Law Clinic going, and it keeps the Community Justice Project Clinic going. So I want to let you guys know that we have that, we have fair trade, um, no, sorry, tea and coffee beans and just everything that you want. So feel free to stop by Brotherhood or stop by the website. They deliver. Just make sure you get your Brotherhood. 
That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and Gary and Rachel. Um, now, uh, my good friend said Lucas, oh, said Lucas, Sadiq Abdullah, he can't make it here tonight because uh, he had a prior engagement. Um, one of his brothers passed away. Um, so he's, he's dealing with that right now. Um, I'm going to like everybody have a moment of silence for that. All right. Um, up next, we got a, a couple of uh, Brotherhood participants speaking. Uh, Rashad Green, Warren, I don't know your last name. Warren Dean. Control Marshall. Um, Get ready to hear some uh, some uh, heartfelt stories about their journey and uh, what brotherhood means to them. Everybody, give them a hand. Hello. Y'all like the food? It's all right to me. But uh, my name is Rashad Green, and I would like to say, like when I first started with the program, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna like start with the bad. Like I say, like a time this year, around like last year, I probably was downtown, probably trying to get into something or in and out of the prison system, you know. Like just no hope, cause my my mom, and my dad, they're a thousand miles away, so you know it's hot out there, cause I feel like I'm alone. But like when I met Sid, Phelan, like they gave me an opportunity. And Nikema, they all gave me an opportunity to like do something different. And like with this program, it just opened my eyes up. Now when I walk outside and I see like people just sitting around doing bad stuff, asking for change and like asking for dollars, I try to help them out. Cause I understand some people have disabilities and some people cannot do for themselves and they need help. But like, just being in the program, it let me see, like, different opportunities. And by saying that is, like, me being in this program, like, I have a job now. I'm, like, currently talking to, like, housing people to get a house and, like, have a stable place to live. Because I, I didn't, you know. Thank you, thank you. Like, because... Like, I done been homeless. Well, like, not even homeless, but, like, I just got into it with my cousin, so I, I didn't want to obey rules, so I just left her house. And, like, I'm like, I can make it on my own. And some people see my tattoos, they, oh, you got tattoos on your face. How you going to get a job? I tell them, like, I got a job. And they, what do you do? Then I tell them about the program. They be like, oh. And, like, some people, some of the guys, I told them about the program, and they work with me. But, unfortunately, they, like, not here tonight. But I just try to encourage people to, like, even though you go through hard times, keep your head up. Because, like, you never know what God going to bless you with. So. How you doing, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Warren. Um, how y'all doing? Um, <laughs> excuse my nerves. I'm kind of sweating. You know, dreads going. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, hot. I'm nervous, so just bear with me. Um, let me tell y'all a little bit of something about my life. Um, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I came to Minnesota in 2006. Um, one thing that I struggle with is trust issues. When I was 
and if I, sorry if I started, you know, tearing up. But I was 11 years old. I had seen my uncle get killed. Um, he was tortured with his neck with a saw. And I deal with that. Um, like, I got mental health issues by dealing with that. Um, so I got a big thing with trust issues. Like, I never trusted nobody, my mom, my dad. Like, I, I just trusted myself and my uncle. And I kind of feel like I was supposed to be protected um, when, that, when that situation happened. So, So I came to Minnesota, started getting in trouble, uh, gang banging, disrespecting my mom. Um, so I got into the ju juvenile system early at 12. And, um, never, that's the long, I've been, okay, to 12, I've been in the prison, I mean, the system all my life. I'm 20 years old. Um, 17, I went to prison for aggravated robbery. You know what I mean? By this time, you know, my mom used to tell me, karma, you going to do something one day, be around the wrong crowd and get yourself in trouble and you ain't going to be able to get out. And I really didn't do the robbery, but I knew who did it and I didn't want to tell. So I went to prison for, for that. In prison, I started off my first six months bad, you know, going to the whole thing that the gang stuff was cool. And one day I sat in, in the hole for six months and I actually was thinking about my life like, do I really want to do this? And at that time, I went to college in there, um, St. Cloud University. I mean, technical college, um, barber school. I graduated, and I just changed my life. Around. I started going to like parenting class because I got, I got a three-year-old daughter, and I started thinking about her. Like, you know, I want, I want, I don't want her to look at me like I look at my dad. And so everything I'm doing now to this day is for my daughter and myself. Um, so in prison, it was, you know, starting off rough and all that and start doing classes. But then again, I was thinking about when I, I'm like, I'm going to get out. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I'm a felon now. It's hard. I ain't got no job. I don't know what to do. I don't got no support. My family don't like me no more. You know, so it was like, I, ain't, I didn't have that support. Only person I had is my girlfriend. She's still by my side. And so coming home, I was looking for jobs. They asked me if I'm a felon, I'm a felon. They turned me down. Nah, you felon. You know, I did every, tried everything. And one day I was actually walking downtown coming from a job interview that I, the lady told me straight up, like, nah, you know, you're not eligible. She cut me, she cut me short because I told her I was a felon. And one person I have to say, I would give a wine on applause for Julie Baker. She actually helped me. <laughs> she stopped me and actually told me I should come down to Brotherhood Review and come to her program. And I was always, you know, like I said, I'm shy. I didn't really like talking and stuff. So I was like, I was ready for it. I was on evade and stuff. And I actually, she actually brought me in, and I ever since then I've been coming every day. So the program has really helped me. It's helped me. Now I'm out proud to say I got a job. I, um, you know, look forward to pay child support now. You know what I mean? Be out for my daughter and stuff, and be proud to say, Daddy, have a you know a job. Take her to little places. You know, without asking my mom for money or something. I can you know I got a job now. You know, and I'm actually. Give them out of the community. I'm at um, Jimmy Lee working with the younger kids in my neighborhood. You know, I walk down the street. I see younger kids. My little cousin look up to me. He having, you know, saying he gangbanging and stuff. I'm sitting down and actually take the time and talk to him and his friends and tell them that's not what's up. Look at me. I'm saying I've been shot, stabbed, and I just tell I just make sure that they learn from my mistakes and the elders that that I learned from. Now they're in prison right now. I'm showing them pictures on, you know, these guys that are in prison now doing life. So thank you.
Hi, everybody. My name is Kentrell. Um, right now, I just want to say most important thing, I'm glad to be here this night at Brotherhood because I missed the last one, and I was, I don't want to talk about it. I'm just glad I'm here right now. And um, I recently was just incarcerated. I did about a year and a half prison and what I did was an unsafe situation and I knew it was before I did it I just was going through some stuff and I didn't know who to talk to and like sometimes things be moving too quick and like because I deal with a lot of busy people and everything like that and I talked to my mom and things like that but she really doesn't like know where I'm coming from and stuff like that because I have a temper and sometimes I blow up but I'm going to say though ever since I got out of jail though um, I have been by brotherhood and attending and everything like that and it's different now because there's more younger youth my age there and everything like that the circle got real big and I'm proud of that because that's what we want to do so um, really I'm just glad to be here tonight and I got more coming. I, I'm just trying to get back situated with my fellas here at Brotherhood. Powerful stuff. You can see why everyone in this room is so excited to be here and so excited to, to be here to support all these young men. Um, next, we're going to bring up Bill uh, for our call to action. Bill is one of the, the board members of Brotherhood and has been there from, from the beginning. So uh, we're, we're pleased to have him here uh, on behalf of the organization. And I'd like everyone to give him a welcoming hand. Glad to see everyone. Nakeem is letting me know I have three minutes for the call to action. <laughs> I'm, I'm between you and Father Greg Boyle, so I understand that. Uh, I want to just say a little bit more about Sadiq. Uh, when we were at the award for Nakima the other night, uh, I was standing next to him and said, boy, I can't wait till the Brotherhood uh, Gala. And he said, I won't be there. And I said, why not? And he said, I got to go to Chicago. And I always kid with him. I said, what? what could Chicago be offering you that would be better than coming to the Brotherhood Gala? And he, I could see he was pretty serious. And he said, I'm going to my brother's funeral. He was shot. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask everybody to do something. And uh, I wouldn't ask people to do something unless I've already done it myself. But on the table is a packet, which I'll ask you in a minute to open up and uh, it's a request for everyone in the room uh, to be able to uh, consider what they can give to help brotherhood uh, to help us continue being a success continue to grow and and uh, Sadiq moved here with his younger brother and his older brother didn't move he stayed in Chicago and he's the one that's not here with us today uh, so what, what, when, when I sp spoke to Sadiq, it just uh, kind of cracked me up, and, and uh, right away, I knew I was going to be given something here at Brotherhood. I mean, I've been to a number of nonprofits, and when you go to a fundraiser, you say, okay, I got a number in mind. That's what I think I can do. I doubled it on the spot. So I know many of you came here with a number in your mind. Uh, I'd like you to double it. Consider that. Uh, when we look at what we gain from the, from the event here, uh, it, it certainly helps brotherhood. But as you've heard, we, we depend uh, heavily on the income from the businesses as well as grants and the donations from everybody. Uh, that really, really makes a difference. And Sadiq's brother, the, the many, many that we can't reach because we are on a shoestring, as Nakima said. Uh, we, we, we need that help. We need that help to not be on a shoestring. 
uh, and, and be able to reach out to the many young men that we can't reach out to because of resource limitations. So uh, I'll ask you to consider that. Uh, we, we accept anything that anybody gives, but if you had a number in mind, think of what it would take in the way of a sacrifice for you uh, to double that and, and try to do that. Uh, if somebody at the table would grab uh, the packet, the, the envelope that's on the table, and uh, in that is uh, an envelope for each of you. When you open it up, you'll see one side is the uh, opportunity to contribute, and the other side is in, in the way of financial, and the other side is the contribution that you might be willing to make in the way of setting up uh, tastings for the Brotherhood guys, uh, the, uh, a number of things listed there. So I'll, uh, I'll cheat on my three minutes and let you start filling that out yourselves. And uh, we're going to come around and collect those at the end of the night. Hopefully, uh, you've heard enough from what's going on in Brotherhood that you'll be touched. And it's our way in here of being able to do something about a problem that, that is one that we all have to contribute to. So please help that. Next up is another former uh, Community Justice Project student, another fellow law student from the University of St. Thomas, uh, Ashley Oliver. She's going to be come up, coming up to do a spoken word piece. Uh, Ashley uh, graduated from the University of St. Thomas two years ago now. Three? Two years ago now. Um, and she was a vital part of helping uh, branch between the law school and the members of Brotherhood. So we'd like to invite her up to do her piece right now. Good evening. Not to really harp on um, what Mr. Bill said, but again, um, Sadiq is probably one of the most amazing people on this planet. If you haven't had the pleasure of meeting him, his family is an amazing family. Um, so please keep him in your thoughts and prayers. And <sighs> I know what else to say about that. Um, but I know everyone here tonight has talked about so much about what you all can give to Brotherhood. And I just want to talk a little bit about or brotherhood has given me and given along so many other people who are volunteers and participants throughout the years. Um, as Jazz said, I was um, a student of Nikima's at the in the Community Justice Project three, four years ago. Um, and I probably would have honestly dropped out of law school at some point. It was so stressful and getting so demanding, but the family I found um, in the clinic and with brotherhood and these young men who were like my brothers, it became a safe haven for me, and I wasn't expecting that. So much is impressed upon you giving back to these men and making sure that they um, you enrich their lives, but the, the Sadiqs and Contrells and Carrie and Christian and all the young men now who are here, they have made me better, and they've emboldened me and emblazoned my light. So I really want to thank them again for what they've given to the community. I don't think they see sometimes their potential and what they've given to so many um, others who are in this room, so thank you guys for your wonderful light and energy. Um, I say all that to say, I'm here tonight because I am an attorney, but I am also a reform, I guess, spoken word poet. Um, so it's something I dabble in from time to time. One of the current um, CJP students in Gary um, asked me to write a piece last December for the Intermediate Arts um, performance that Brotherhood had last, um, last December. And I said, sure. And um, it encapsulates a lot of the issues that are unfortunately going on today. And it's called Blank, so I hope you enjoy it. I'm drawing a blank. No, really. I'm drawing a blank. Because my poems are usually pinned for particular persons, line by line of sublime lullabies, spilling out travesties and triumphs about isolated individuals as poems are meant to be, but I'm drawing a blank. No, really, 
I'm drawing a blank. Because this poem needs to be one size fits all. Damn near Herculean in strength, gargantuan size. Perfect perpetual pentameter, scrolling off into infinity. Struck somewhere in the deepest spasm of space continuum. Because every 28 hours, another black person is killed by them. And I've got to work and sleep because the poets got to eat. So really, I need to draw a blank. These poems have to be boilerplate language, standard form agreements in society where officers draw guns before drawing conclusions, but not until after drawing white chalk around black bodies. These poems have to be templates to trace, commonly used context carrying no clear delineation because careless comments from colored men becomes famous last words, dancing off of dying tongues. These poems have to be cliche, purposefully politically correct provisions, all because the brilliance of the black man's beauty blinds the boys in blue and morphs them into fixtures of fear and fright. These poems have to shift, his poems have to change, his poems have to rearrange, so excuse me as I draw some blanks because the moment that I pose my pen to write down this poem is for this boy, this poem is for this man, this poem is for him, I turn to CNN, read the latest victim's name and I have to start all over again, so here lies blank. He was the son of blank and blank. He died of gunshot wounds to his blank. He leaves behind a sister and brother, blank and blank. He aspired to someday be blank and will forever miss his blank. But I don't have the gall or the gumption, the balls of the bravado, the strength of the stamina to give each of you the eulogies that you deserve, the swan song of a life soul stolen suddenly, the closing chapter of a classic novel that culminated on a cliffhanger, the sweetest soliloquy as the curtains fall. So forgive me, I can't keep up at the rate that they keep initiating black men into your fraternity of the fallen, so I draw blanks. Because when I try to write about Trayvon, Born in an usually cold winter in 95, who grew to be tall like the palm trees in Sunshine State, who had his mother's almond eyes and his father's sheepish smiles with dreams of aviation and going up, up, up until he was gunned down and his dreams went blank. My attention had to turn then to Jonathan Farrell, 24, former fan youth football player, someone's fiance, who survived a car crash late one night in Charlotte. Instead of being greeted by sudden hospitality and helping hands of two, he was branched by 10 fingers and 10 bullets until he closed his eyes for the last time and the whole scene went blank. And before this poem could be completed, it was Jordan Baker's face that danced across my screen. He happened to don a hoodie one night and he happened to look like the suspect that he wasn't, but he was killed in a trap strewn Houston alley with roaches and rats. He leaves behind a seven-year-old son who says the memories of his dad are already fading awake, going blank. And by July and summertime in Y, the son said an Eric Garner, gentle guy, giant, grandpa. His asthma had attacked him many times before, but it had an extra say on this time. One of New York's finest compressed his chest into his last words, I can't breathe, rang out. His wife cried out. Who will be Santa Claus to my grandbabies this year? His space at the dinner table will forever remain blank. And then there's John Crawford, 20 miles up, up the dusty Ohio roads I call home, wrongfully accused of branching a gun of customers. The police ran up behind him. He's on the phone, back turned, bullet shot, bullet shots, bullets continue to be shot as his girlfriend and father are on speakerphone listening until the resounding shots stop, until the cacophony ceases and the airwaves go blank. And then there's Tamir Rice, age 12. Not even a teenager yet. Not even a crack of his voice yet. Not even a hair in his chest yet. But not even old enough to be a viable threat to these officers who we pay to protect. But in a matter of two seconds, they fired two shots because two officers abandoned all protocol and civic responsibility because they're so warped by his mere existence. But they're on paid leave, carte blanche, point blank. And when I tried to write about Mike Brown, I couldn't. Because my baby brother's name is Mike too. And he has the same round face and curious eyes as you do, Mike. And how quickly he can become you too, Mike, I draw a blank. How fast Mike Brown becomes Mike Oliver, I blank. How if my mom got the same phone call your mama did, how her whole world would go blank. How if my daddy got the same news your daddy did, how the light in his eyes would go blank. 
how they can leave my baby brother, my sun and my stars, like a dead carcass riding in this midday sun for hours without a reason, no reason, blank, how you a shot point, blank, how the man who did it got off without a charge, his record, blank, look at the attorney's faces, their expressions, blank, the sheriff's face, blank, the mayor's face, blank, FDLPD, blank, the FBI, blank, even my president's face, blank. Your space at the Christmas table. Blank. The memory of your sweet voice. Blank. Your silly grin after making a funny joke. Blank. Your years left to be a father, an uncle, a provider, a husband, a dreamer, an activist, a citizen, a man, wife. Blank. Last time I performed this, I said this off script right now. I haven't touched this poem since December. I like to edit poems. And I can think of about 10 names off the top of my head for activists. And the fact that that's worth mentioning is terrifying. I'm drawing a blank because I have to use this poem again. There will continue to be a variable parade of black men, a mere 28 or so hours between them, lives lost, not worthy of the poetry and the prose that in my lifetime I will never have the time to fully encapsulate. And until something changes, until something rearranges, in another mere day or two, I'll turn on my TV and see yet another new but all too familiar face. Heave a heavy sigh, pick up my pen, and continue to fill in the blank. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, where Ashley go? Ashley, I'm going to get you. Don't be doing that. Good job. I like that. Um, next, next couple keynote speakers, uh, I got Mike Tamale introducing Father Greg Boyle here. So give it up for Mike Tamale. I'd like to start by asking Ashley Oliver to stand up again, please, and take another round of applause. <laughs> My heart's pounding a little hard there, Ashley. Um, thank you for that. I think... Um, <coughs> Maybe the simplest introduction I could give to Father Gregory Boyle is that if um, he had his way <coughs> and then if Nakima had her way and Brotherhood Inc. had their way, uh, besides uh, reaching deep into our checkbooks, we'd all reach deep into our own uh, hearts and our minds and, and take a look at our own stereotypes, our own prejudices. And the one that uh, I want to relate to you uh, briefly here was uh, when I had the chance to go to brother or to uh, Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. Nakima was driving this big old van. I was up in the front seat with her. It was full of uh, <coughs> the guys uh, from Brotherhood and Phelan and um, some of the law students. We come around the corner of their beautiful building in LA and it probably was 40 guys standing out in the parking lot and I guess they were handing out jobs or something but 
Um, and I've, I've spent my life working uh, kind of on the streets of St. Paul and Minneapolis and a few other places, including LA, but the concept of tattoos was uh, not something that I was fully aware of uh, how <coughs> extensive they could get on a man's head and face and ears and mustache and neck. And so anyway, pretty much all these 40 guys were covered like that. And my initial reaction was I'm looking at Nakima going, so what, we're getting out of the van now or what? Uh, <laughs> I'm looking around for Phelan, <laughs> who's a large man, and I thought that'd be good um, to stand near him. And then I looked out again, and two of these guys were uh, holding in their arms one and two-year-old children, playing with them right on the edge of the parking lot. A couple other of them came out and greeted us and proceeded to give us a tour of this uh, amazing program and amazing facility and amazing love. And the architect of all that is Father Gregory Boyle. Please welcome him tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nakima. Thank you, my brothers. Thank you, Ashley. Where is Ashley? There you are. Okay. You are the shape of God's heart. Uh, it's a privilege. I, I, I've always uh, loved the connection with, with Brotherhood, Inc., and and homeboy, and so it's a, indeed a privilege to be here. Um, it's a privilege of my life uh, for 30 years to have worked with gang members, so, um, and they've taught me everything of value. The day won't ever come when uh, I am more noble, or I have more courage, or I am closer to God than the young men and women, I, uh, thousands of them that I've come to know over the years. Uh, at Homeboy Industries. People like Louis Perez, who kind of runs the place, he along with a couple homies, they run the place while I'm not there. Well, they run it when I am there too, but... <laughs> and uh, so he's become something of a public speaker in his own right, and uh, he, he likes doing it. And, and we went out to dinner a couple weeks ago, and he was uh, giving me tips on how to speak publicly. <laughs> and he said, you know, you have to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> I said, yeah, no shit. Uh, so, uh, so brace yourselves. Uh, you know, the truth is, uh, Homeboy Industries and Brotherhood Inc., you, you always have to brace yourself in a way because you stand at the margins which is the only way that margins get erased. If you stand at the margins, you look under your feet, occasionally they're erased, sometimes they're not, but you still stand out there. And people will accuse you of wasting your time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And that's what uh, Brotherhood Inc. does for a living. And this is why you should uh, absolutely double whatever number was in your mind earlier. Sure, go ahead. And so uh, Brotherhood Inc. Uh, wants to uh, call people to imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle. It wants to dismantle the barriers that exclude. It wants to kind of go out to the edges where the poor and the powerless and the voiceless are and stand there. And people notice because you stand there. And you stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear and you stand with those whose dignity has been denied and you stand when you really feel privileged 
to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop, and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. The reason we say black lives matter is because there's an idea that's taken root in the world and it's at the root of all that's wrong with it. And the idea would be this, that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. And so we choose to stand against that idea. Mother Teresa suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we imagine a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it? No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no peace. No matter how singularly focused we may well be on those worthy goals, they actually can't happen unless there's some undergirding sense that we belong to each other that somehow we are connected, that we are kin. So indeed, the homies have taught me everything of value, and, and I'm so grateful to them. But last couple of years, they've taught me how to text, and, um, and I'm really grateful because I find it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. <laughs> and uh, so I'm uh, you know, pretty good at it, LOL and OMG and BTW and... And the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. <laughs> and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. <laughs> Autocorrect has really been screwing me up lately because, uh, you know, I sent a message. A homie said, hey, dog, uh, can, you do me, can you help me out and with my rent? I'm a little short. So I wanted to tell him that, you know, I didn't ha really have enough money to be able to help him this week, maybe the next week. And I, and I typed, things are tight, and I pushed send. And autocorrect uh, altered it to read, thongs are tight. <laughs> and the homie wrote back, uh, so sorry to hear that. Uh, uh, how about my rent? Uh, anyway, I digress. So anyway, so I was in a car with two ho homies, older vatos, Manuel and Poncho, and they were going to help me give a talk somewhere. So they were sitting in a car, and Manuel was in the front seat. We're 50 minutes on the road, and uh, Manuel gets an incoming text, and uh, he reads it to himself, and he kind of chuckles. I said, what is it? He goes, oh, it's dumb. <laughs> it's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, I'd just seen Snoopy. I just greeted him as the day began. And Snoopy and Manuel work together in the clock-in room where they clock in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gang members who work at Homeboy Industries. And it's a tough job because occasionally gang members can be attitudinal. <laughs> so I said, well, what's he say? Oh, that's dumb. Hang on. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> we died laughing, I almost drove into oncoming traffic. And, and then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. Now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us and a them? You know, even in service, we all want to be of service, but sometimes there's distance even in service. I'm the service provider, you're the service recipient. No, you want to bridge that gap. Service is the hallway that gets you into the ballroom. You want to get to the ballroom, which is the place of kinship. And if kinship was our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice. We'd be celebrating it. 
one of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend. And, and I can remember once he had uh, uh, famously told a reporter who had commented to him, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual, which of course is the goal. How do we arrive at that exquisite mutuality where there is no us and them, that where there is no daylight that separates us, no kinship, no justice, no kinship, no peace. Uh, no homie found more job opportunities than this guy. Everybody called him Dreamer. I knew him since he was a little knucklehead growing up in the projects and got into a gang and got into trouble. Very smart kid, though. He never did school very much, uh, but had, had a great... Uh, a dangerous sense of humor, which I always appreciated. And, but I always would find him job opportunities in those early years. And, uh, but then he'd sort of gravitate back to vague criminality, usually something involving drugs, the sale of or the use of. Then he'd wander back to me. And he was a yo-yo for a while there in his early 20s, in and out of being locked up. Well, this one time he finished a, a four-month stretch, uh, probation violation, county jail. And there he is sitting in front of me in my office. And he says what gang members often say, this time it'll be different. And I go, okay. So with him sitting there, I call a friend of mine who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra, California. And he had hired homies in the past, and I think maybe he'll do it again. And sure enough, yeah, he says, yeah, tell him he can start tomorrow. And that's a holy man right there. So Dreamer began working at this vending machine company, and two weeks later, there he is again in front of my desk, and I go, Híjole, Madre Santa, here we go again. But this time he pulls out of his uh, pocket his very first paycheck, and he waves it proudly, and he says, Damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. <laughs> I mean, my mom, she's proud of me, and my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well, gosh, who? <laughs> and he looked at me strangely and he said, well, God, of course. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's right. That, that would be God right there, yeah. He said, you thought I was going to say you. I said, no, gosh, God's, God's number one, yeah. He said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days? He goes, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now, he said. <laughs> well, we fell out of our chairs and we dissolved in laughter and I defy you to identify exactly who's the service provider, who's the service recipient. It's mutual. So Homeboy Industries was born a long time ago in 1988 when I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens, Aliso Village, the largest grouping of public housing west of Mississippi. We had eight gangs at war with each other when I drove up, making it, according to the LAPD, the place of the highest concentration of gang activity anywhere in Los Angeles. I buried my first young person in 1988 killed because of the sadness and buried my 199th uh, last week. I count them because they matter. So we did a lot of things in those early days. We started a school because there were so many gang members not in school, junior high age, selling drugs and violent. So I walked out to them and I said, hey, you know, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, they all said, yeah. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them, you know, so that kind of forced my hand. And so across the street from the, our church was our elementary school, the first two floors, the parochial school. Well, the whole third floor was the convent. So I went up to the convent and I gathered all the nuns in the living room and I said, hey, would you guys mind you know, moving out, and, um, 
and we could turn the convent into like a school for gang members. And, and they said, sure. So they did, and, and, and gang members came in large numbers to this school, which upset the apple cart a little bit because aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed, you know, good people in and bad people out. So that was a good gospel challenge. And then they said, if only we had jobs, and so myself and the women, we marched around the factories that surrounded the projects trying to find felony-friendly employers, and that wasn't so forthcoming. And then uh, we started crews, different things, landscaping, maintenance, graffiti removal, a crew to build a child care center for the church. And then uh, the unrest happened in 1992, and a movie producer uh, came to me and said, uh, how can I help? I said, well, buy this old abandoned bakery across the street from the church. It has ovens. We'll put hair nets on enemy rival gang members, and we'll call it Homeboy Bakery, which was the, the extent of my business plan. <laughs> and we were off and running. And then uh, a month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market in downtown L.A. Once we had plural, we came up with the highfalutin name Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this venture, you know, and not everything worked. Uh, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy plumbing really was not hugely successful. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I, uh, <laughs> I did not see that coming. And nobody ever intends to do this, but uh, we back our way into evolving our way into something, and so now we're the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program in the United States. <clears throat> so 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors and, uh, and um, all of them are trying to get into our 18 month training program where they have uh, curricular activities and uh, classes and uh, case management and uh, mental health therapy, everybody's in therapy. It's a healing place of hope. Free tattoo removal, no place on the planet Earth removes more tattoos than we do. 50,000 laser treatments a year. And then we have all our social enterprises, uh, solar panel installation training. We have uh, Homeboy Bakeries Thriving, home, Homeboy Silk Screen. Um, so we need to work together on that too because uh, we've got a lot of equipment and we've been doing that for 21 years so they, they know a few things about it. A homeboy diner, the only place you can get food at uh, um, City Hall. We have a restaurant at LAX, American Airlines Terminal. Uh, we have uh, what we call homeboy grocery, which is chips and salsas that we sell in all the Ralph stores in uh, California. Um, ho homeboy diner, uh, excuse me, homeboy lunch truck. Uh, that's been around for about six months. Homeboy homegrown merchandise, where we sell our logo stuff. In uh, Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, will gladly take your order. <laughs> it's kind of a famous place in L.A. You know, if you go there for breakfast or lunch, you're going to run into somebody. Jim Carrey, the movie star, was there the other day. And Jack Black, uh, another movie star. All the electeds uh, go there. Um, a couple months ago, with only two hours' notice, we got a phone call from the Secret Service, and Vice President Joe Biden uh, uh, was wanted to go there for lunch, you know, and uh, his motorcade and everything, and the homies were uh, taking selfies with him. And uh, <laughs> well, I was on my annual eight-day retreat, so I wasn't there, you know. Uh, and so when I got uh, back to the office, a homie was filling me in. While you were gone, we were visited by an MVP. I said, MVP, do you mean a VIP? That one, right there, <laughs> VIP. He said, wow, gee, imagine here at Homeboy Industries, we were visited by the Vice President of the United States, Mick Romney. <laughs> I swear to you, this is what, uh, and it wasn't Mitt, it was Mick, you know. And I think he thought that mainly because all white people look alike. <laughs> and if Barack Obama won the first slot, shouldn't the one who got the next number of votes become the vice president? So uh, we think we might start a current affairs class now at uh, Homeboy. 
Anyway, but famously, uh, Diane Keaton showed up, uh, movie star, Annie Hall, Academy Award, Godfather movies, big movie star. She was there for lunch, and her waitress was Glinda. And Glinda, homegirl, big girl, tattooed, gang member, felon, parolee, she has no clue who Diane Keaton is, you know, and so she's taking her order, and, and Diane Keaton says, what do you recommend? And uh, Glinda rattles off the three platillos that she particularly likes. And, and then uh, Diane Keaton says, oh, I'll have that second one. That one sounds good. And it's at that moment something dawns on Glinda. She, she looks at Diane Keaton. She says, wait a minute. I feel like I know you. You know, like maybe we've met. <laughs> and Diane Keaton decides to sort of deflect it humbly. Oh, I don't know. I suppose I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And then Glenda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, boy, that just took my breath away when I heard it. And, and I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings now that I think of it. But suddenly, kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind. And, and we need go no further than hearing Jesus say to the gathered that you may be one. I suppose he could have said more about himself, but it's really about us. All of us are called to be what Alice Miller, the late great child psychologist, called enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love return people to themselves. I think at Brotherhood Inc., you don't hold the bar up and ask people to measure up. You just hold the mirror up and you tell people the truth, knowing that your truth is my truth and my truth is a gang member's truth and it all happens to be the same truth. And here's the truth. You are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then you watch people become that truth, especially those who are standing out at the margins. And then they inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. But everybody knows you got to reach in and help and dismantle messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way, that keep people from seeing their truth. In the Acts of the Apostles, they have a line that says, And awe came upon everyone. It is the measurement of health in any community at all. That if we stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than in judgment at how they carry it. Some years ago, I was invited to speak to 600 social workers at uh, Richmond, Virginia. And I always say yes to things, and, and then I don't read the invitation very carefully. And, and uh, so when I did, I, uh, kind of late, uh, I noticed uh, I'm probably going to give a keynote or something, maybe to open it, to close it. And I noticed it said, um, it's a 9 to 5 all day gang in service. I am to be the only speaker at this event. So I invited two homies uh, into my office, Andre, African-American gang member who at the time worked in the bakery, and Jose, a Latino gang member who had worked his way up into our substance abuse uh, department. I sat him down. I said, look, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I want you to get up and tell your stories. Take your time. Because <laughs> we got a long-ass day to fill. Well, I hadn't heard their stories, and uh, Jose got up, and Jose had, was in our 18-month program and started in the janitorial, what we call the humble place. Everybody starts there. And he worked his way up, a gang member, tattooed, parolee. Uh, 
but now he was solidly in, in his own recovery and uh, was helping younger people, uh, younger homies deal with their addiction issues. A man who spent a long time in prison, even though he was only 25 years old, had a long stretch as well as a homeless man and an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. And he got up and he began in sort of a self-effacing way. He said, I, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when my mom looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 uh, social workers gasped, and he says, it sounds way worser in Spanish. He said to them, you know, <laughs> we got whiplash going from gasp to laugh. He said, I think I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California, and she walked me up to an orphanage, and she knocked on the door, and when the guy came to the door, she said, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me. My grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through, and second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he stopped speaking so overwhelmed with emotion and he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see and when he could speak again he said I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds I didn't want anybody to see them. And now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no peace. Let me just close with this. You know, people always ask about enemies working together, and that's part of the thing that happens. A homie will come in. Our program is not for those who need help. It's only for those who want it. You have to walk through the doors. But they'll come in and say, I'm ready, ready, ready. I'll say, okay, I have an opening in the bakery, but you have to work with X, Y, and Z. And I rattle off the names of enemies, rivals. And they always do the same thing. They think, and then they say, okay, I'll work with them. I'm not going to talk to them. And I remember how much in the early days, how much that bothered me, and, until you discover, of course, that human beings can't demonize people they know. Humans can't sustain that. So uh, I hired this guy, everybody called him Youngster. And Youngster was a little tiny guy, 19 years old. I thought he was ready. So I bring him to our homeboy silkscreen factory, which is a huge uh, a kind of factory, uh, kind of off campus. 
and uh, again has been around for 21 years. Thousands and thousands of enemy gang members have worked there. We usually have about 30 working there at any given time. And so uh, I walked in and I introduced this guy to all his coworkers, and I watch him uh, shake hands with each one, firm handshake, looks them in the eye. And there were a lot of enemies, a lot of rivals, and I think, wow, that's great. Until he gets to this last guy, a guy who seems to be wanting to avoid this encounter altogether, a kid everybody called Puppet. And when Puppet and Youngster are in each other's vicinity, they mumble something, they stare at their shoes, they don't shake hands. Well, I know they're enemies because I know what gangs they're from, but he just finished shaking hands with a whole bunch of enemies. Uh, I discover later that this is a hatred that's really quite deep and quite personal, uh, beyond which neither of them think they can really get past. So I sense that much at the moment, and I say, hey, look, um, if you guys can't hang working together, let me know. I've got a bunch of people who want this job, and they don't say a word. Well, six months later, Puppet leaves his home to go to a corner store some distance from his house, and he buys something. And on the way home, for some reason, he decides to take a shortcut. So he dodges into an alley, and because he took this detour, suddenly, unexpectedly, he's surrounded by ten members of a rival gang, ten against one, and they beat him badly. And he falls to the ground, and while he's lying there, they will not stop kicking his head until he's lifeless. Somebody finds his body and takes him to White Memorial Hospital where he's declared effectively brain dead. But it's the policy there to keep you connected to machines for 48 hours so that you can get two full days of a flat read where there's no brain activity. And then the doctors can sign the death certificate making it official. This allowed family and friends to gather. I was uh, in St. Louis giving a talk. I flew home immediately. I've seen a lot of horrible things in my life, but nothing to compare to the sight of this young man with his head swollen many times its size. It was horrifying. You could barely train your eyes on him. So at the end of the two days, as a priest, I said a blessing prayer. We anointed his forehead with oil. We disconnected, and a week later we buried him. But in the first 24 hours, while Puppet was lying beaten in the hospital, I was alone in my office. It was 8.30 at night, and the phone rang. And it was Youngster, Puppet's co-worker from the silkscreen factory. Hey, he says, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. I said, yeah, it is. And then with a certain kind of eagerness even, he says, is there anything I can do? Can I give him my blood? Then we both fall silent under the weight of it. Until finally, he breaks the silence, choking back his tears. And he says with great deliberation, he was not my enemy he was my friend. We worked together. Now, can I say that always happens at Homeboy Industries and at Brotherhood, Inc.? Yes, of course. Any exceptions? No. And it shouldn't surprise us that God's own dream come true for us, that we be one, just happens to be our own deepest longing for ourselves. For it turns out, it's mutual. And so you stand at the edges, at the margins, and occasionally you look under your feet and the margins have been erased because you chose to stand there, but sometimes not. But you always will brace yourself 
because people will accuse you of wasting your time. But in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And each and every one of you tonight is here because you want to make those voices heard. And may God bless you in doing it. Thank you very much. That was powerful and very sobering. I'm still taking all of that in. Between Ashley's poem, the messages from the young men at Brotherhood, and the message that Father Bull just gave, I'm just I'm blown away right now. I'm overwhelmed, but I'm also very thankful that God gave us this gift to gather tonight and to hear from those who've been on the front lines and those who are most affected by the issues that plague those who are on the margins. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight and being a part of the celebration of the work that's going forward, but also being a part of helping to build the next level of the work that we're doing here. <laughs> 